and get to the main um, website. You can enter in CL994 or you can just join by text. Um, so let's get started. So I'm going to be talking about understanding surface reflectivity or albedo as it's called. So what is it and how can it affect climate change? And just a little bit about myself. I am interested in landscape ecology, human environmental reactions, atmospheric physics, and remote sensing. I do a lot of work in micrometeorological instrumentation, layman's terms, the tower that you see on top of the building that has a lot of uh, climatological sensors. So when you pull out your phone and you check the weather, someone like me who's on top of buildings or in the middle of a forest trying to get that data to make sure that it's good when you check the weather. So there's been a lot of evidence uh, for changes in climate. Um, we've seen this from multiple different types of climatic factors such as uh, strong, strong tropical cyclones and hurricanes, uh, a lot of cold days and cold nights. We've seen here in Michigan, we don't have that much snow, but we had freezing rain as well as ice storms these last couple of weeks. Uh, we've seen changes in the surface uh, temperatures as well as top of the atmosphere, the ozone layer. And scientists of all, from all over the world have been looking at these different types of effects on the climate and trying to quantify what is going on. And though surface albedo is kind of one of the most important biogeophysical uh, mechanisms that um, act on the surface and, the, and at the top of the atmosphere, uh, knowledge and understanding of it uh, has been very, very limited. So we're going to be talking about that today. So we're going to get into the basics of climate change, the factors affecting it, the observed impacts and how we can measure it. And then I'm going to be talking about surface reflectivity, so albedo. So what is it and why is it important and what is its role in climate change? that is the majority of my research. Then I'll give a really brief um, a case study about analyzing climate change using that surface reflectivity, albedo, at the Calophyological Station, and then just um, bring all of our ideas together. So go ahead, pull out your phones, because I want you to, whoa, <laughs> one second. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys hit the hill on that of different things that have affected climate change. You know, we've had a lot of human activities um, from as far back we can go in the 1800s all the way up through that have observed that human activities such as burning fossil fuels, reducing the amount of forest cover through uh, deforestation, the expansion of farming, urban development here in Battle Creek. We live in a slightly urbanized region. You know, we're more we got some forests and stuff around us, but we're also surrounded by a lot of different. Um, urban regions. We got Chicago just a couple of hours away. We got Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, you know, Detroit. These are large metropolitan areas where we have vastly changed the landscape into uh, through a lot of urban development. There are a lot of industrial activities. We burn fossil fuels to heat our houses and to have AC in the summertime and much, much more. And through these um, climate effects, we have seen a lot of in observed impacts. Uh, incidents of extreme weather, they have been projected to increase as a result of climate 
climate change. Uh, many locations have seen an increase in the number of heat waves they've experienced. Here in Michigan, we've seen a number of ice storms, especially the ones that have occurred in the last few weeks. Um, in uh, ecosystems on the land and in the ocean, they've continued to be affected by impacts from climate change. We have animals, plants, bacteria, viruses, which used to be very limited in regions that they would thrive in, have been moving and migrating to different areas due to changes in temperatures um, throughout the, the planet. And the meltings of ice sheets and glaciers as well has contributed to sea level rises. In places in uh, the Caribbean, where I am initially from, we have a problem with sea level rises. If we get a couple of uh, inches of water, we're probably gonna be submerged because we're fat as a pancake. So these are a lot of different impacts that people are um, seeing both from the local region all the way globally throughout the planet that we need to, to understand. And one of the, the hardest parts about this observed impact from climate change is we don't know the percentage of the contribution for each of these different types of impacts. We've seen droughts, we're seeing fires, extreme events in water and food security, but we don't know that potential contribution uh, to climate change, not only throughout the year, but also seasonally, uh, annually, decadally, and even long-term uh, projections as well. We are not, we, we do not know these potential contributions and they change. So we can measure changes in climate, and this has been done both historically in the past through the geologic record. Uh, if you see uh, Bob Hollis's, um, uh, Hollister's uh, presentation, he looks at ice, um, ice cores within the Arctic. And we can also check ch changes in the climate system um, by um, recording observations that we see upon the landscape, as well as computer models. So we can use computer models to reconstruct not only past climate, but the present climate and the future climate as well. And though I focus majorly on greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and very importantly, income and sunlight, these are a lot of different ways we can measure changes in climate, including changes in the sea level, surface and ocean temperatures, changes in snow, we don't see much here in Michigan, which we would usually be inundated by by now, changes in Arctic ice and glaciers. So let's talk about albedo. So sunlight usually comes from the sun, it comes through our atmosphere and it warms the earth and it usually energizes the, the, the earth's climate system. So we get seasonal cycles, we get orbital cycles, and uh, all of these variables affect the energy balance of the earth's surface. So when sunlight reaches the earth, it usually heats the land, the ocean, the atmosphere. And from there, uh, some of that sunlight is reflected back into the atmosphere or it reaches the earth and is absorbed and warms the planet. So we can calculate the ratio of that change in solar radiation, which is reflected back into the atmosphere versus the ones, the sunlight that is absorbed into the ground surface. And this is called albedo, surface reflectivity. It's usually expressed in dimensionless terms. So taking the diagram here, if we had sunlight coming in and all of that radiation uh, was absorbed into the surface, the albedo would be zero. So we're thinking really dark surfaces. For example, if you're standing in the middle of Chicago, on an asphalt street in the middle of summer, we're all gonna be baking like chickens because it's really hot. All of that sunlight is being absorbed straight into the surface and you're standing on top of it. Think of making an egg, making an egg. On the flip side, all of that sun, solar radiation that comes from the sun being reflected back into the atmosphere causes an albedo of one. So think of a nice snow surface, which we currently don't have in Michigan. If you were standing in the middle of a snow, snowboarding um, hill, you're usually blinded by quite a bit of snow because all of that solar radiation, which would usually be um, absorbed into the surface, is reflected back into the atmosphere and into our eyeballs. So the more reflective a surface is, the higher its albedo, or its surface reflectivity, and the, the, the greater the potential for the cooling of the climate. So when the Earth emits the same amount of energy it absorbs, then the energy balance budget of the Earth is in balance. We get a very stable temperature. But if a significant increase or decrease in the sun's energy output occurs, we can basically cause the planet to warm or cool. So here in Michigan, we're very fortunate to have multiple different types of landscapes. Usually in March, we would have a very snow-covered landscape 
uh, we have lots of forests in and around Michigan. We have lots of croplands and grasslands, bare surfaces, and then we also have a lot of suburban and urban ecosystems such as the map and um, benefit map and science center. So based on these um, landscapes, we're gonna look at albedo in real life scenarios. So I have lots of candy to give out. So if we were standing in a, a grass landscape right now based on all of the radiation from the sun being, being absorbed into the surface being zero and all of it being reflected back being one, what do you think the albedo of a grassland would be? Just raise your hand and I will ask you. Yes? Uh, close to zero. Why do you say close to zero? straight in. 
However, let's say there was a kind of nice sheen of white, you know, ice on the top, or it was a calm day, there's no waves, there's no wind. A lot of that radiation is gonna pretty much bounce straight off the surface of the water and head back. So it can have a very, very wide range. So putting together all of the different types of ecosystems we have on this planet, what do you think the albedo of the Earth is? Yes? A, a little high. Oh, a little high. What do you think, 0.5? I, like, I just kind of like an average, I guess. Okay. Like balanced, maybe. So that's a, that is a good, um, a good reasoning. So it's not as high as 0.5, but if we take all of these different types of ecosystems and we put it together, we get about 0.35. And that's because when you think about astronauts who take that nice little picture of Earth from space, and we see a, like a blue marble with some green intermingled with that, that's kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of water and grasslands and deserts and that, that average of it all kind of brings our planetary um, albedo to about 0.3. So the hardest question of all, this, um, so what do you think happens to give an albedo of exactly one? So we know, we know snow is about 0.85, but what is an albedo of exactly one? Yes. Solar panels. <laughs> <laughs> what are solar panels made out of? <laughs> so metal actually absorbs a lot of radiation. I'll, I'll give you one more shot. It's, it's similar to solar panels. We know that solar panels reflect a lot of light, right? What is similar to solar panels? Yes. Correct. <laughs> you don't get to choose. <laughs> pretty much takes all the radiation, all of that stuff that we see, just hit it and immediately bounces off. Great. So what other factors do you guys think affect albedo? and senescent states, you know, leaf area indices, deforestation, changes in ice and snow cover. You guys hit on like the land use land cover change, cloudiness, the weather, especially here in Michigan. We can be really cloudy early in the morning. We can have some sunlight in the middle of the day and Michigan says, hold my bear, we're cloudy again and foggy in the evening. And all of that's gonna change the amount of surface reflectivity that we have because of that sunlight is coming in, it's gonna hit those clouds and stuff and it's gonna change the composition. And so, Although very long uh, recognized like, significantly as being important, surface reflectivity and albedo uh, has been very rarely included in climate policies for like different types of ecosystems and land management. And this is because it's really hard to, to take the albedo of multiple different types of surfaces. It's very expensive. The cost of the instrumentation, such as the one that's on top of the, the building, is very expensive and really hard to maintain. So using our framework, we measure albedo, which comes from the sun, uh, accounting for changes in the solar radiation interacting with the atmosphere, which is my nice little blue box there. Uh, we use solar radiation on the surface to determine uh, what albedo is based on space and time. So the amount of uh, energy uh, absorbed or radiated by the Earth is dependent on that atmosphere, so that big blue box there. And it depends on its composition. So greenhouse gases. We got things such as carbon dioxide, water vapor, ozone, and they naturally occur you know, very uniformly for the most part 
um, in most regions um, and can absorb and release energy uh, more efficiently compared to other abundant gases such as oxygen and uh, nitrogen. So once we know um, what our changes in albedo is, we can then calculate something called the radiative forcing. And that's basically uh, a comparison for taking our, our energy from the sun and converting it into uh, watts per meter squared. So something tangible we can measure. And then ignoring the, the, the math that we have here, <laughs> we will take that radiative forcing and convert it into something called global warming potential. And that's basically taking that energy and converting it into a carbon dioxide equivalent. So everyone knows that carbon dioxide exists and we can measure it using sensors, but how do we measure sunlight? So once we convert that sunlight into a measurable carbon dioxide equivalency, we can determine whether the, the, the ecosystem or the landscape is either warming or cooling. And it also depends on a lot of different factors such as agronomic practices, the scale we're using, seasonal, seasonality and climate, whether plants have tr uh, leaves on them versus when they're green, growing season changes and crop species. So where do you think climate change is happening? You feel free to, to drop some dots on the, the holy bee. <laughs> All right, I'm seeing um, quite a couple in the US. I'm seeing China and Russia, so a lot of big countries. I'm seeing a couple in the Antarctica and Target. Oh. Seeing uh, uh, one in uh, you know some developing countries such as you know India. I'm seeing the ocean, which is also correct. <laughs> there are no wrong answers here. <laughs> Great. So you guys hit the nail on the head. You know, climate change is occurring in a lot of different countries, but we don't have to think about it in terms of just countries. We can look at it globally, yes, because whatever we do here locally does affect changes happening um, at a global scale. For example, this is um, urbanization. We know that urban regions are gonna expand. You know, as humans, you know, all decide to continue um, updating infrastructure. We're going to get much larger cities, and we can change the surface reflectivity based on those urban regions quite substantially. But one second. <coughs> We know as well that we don't have to look very far globally to see if there's changes happening on the, the planet. We can say right here in Battle Creek at the Battle Creek Math and Science Center. From here, you can see multiple different ecosystems all coalescing in one. We have a river running through Battle Creek. We have the buildings, the many different buildings, you know, that are made up of concrete. We've got asphalt driveways and, a con and, and uh, asphalt roads, and we also have some nice you know, trees and uh, parks and uh, buildings that we can um, interact with as well. So what this is saying is that the interactions between life and climate are very, very complex. You know, individual organisms like us, you know, we kind of exist in like a range of temperature, precipitation, humidity, uh, and sunlight that makes us feel comfortable. Uh, but as soon as we are kind of exposed to something that we don't like and it's outside our normal range, we kind of either adapt, migrate, build some buildings or we die. So, <laughs> you know, scientific observations, you know, show that these changes are happening constantly um, and will continue to happen in the future as well. But it's not just happening um, at the same rate everywhere. That magnitude and direction is occurring uh, completely differently in multiple, multiple different places. Take, for example, uh, the area where I do my research in. That's just about 10 miles away from, the, uh, from Battle Creek at the Kellogg Biological Station. Um, and here you can see that this is a much drastic area of ecosystem and landscape we're looking at. We're seeing crops, we're seeing forests, we're seeing kettle lakes, and not that many buildings. But climate change is still happening here as well, just at a different scale and magnitude. So in my case study, I analyzed climate change um, through surface at, um, reflectivity at the Kellogg Biological Station. Um, though much of my research looks at uh, climate over multiple different types of landscapes, 
for this case study, which is really close to Battle Creek, I kind of focused on biofuel crops and grasslands, uh, which have a potential of replacing uh, other types of unsustainable um, ecosystems um, with other different types of crops. So this data was retrieved using uh, two different methods. So I used a micrometeorological tower, same as the one that's on the building, and they were placed in multiple different crops, as well as walking around manually with a measurement, taking measurements over the course of five years. So we focused our research on seven different bioenergy crops. So switchgrass, uh, Miss Kansas native grasses, early succession and prairie, these are all perennials. So as soon as you know the ground is uh, warming up from winter, boom, they start to grow. We also looked at corn and sorghum. And these are annual row crops. So every year, a farmer has to go out with his like contraction and feed the ground, fertilize it, and plant it in rows. So in total, we measured 21 different crops over five years. And from here, if we're just even just looking at a small scale in terms of crops, we can see that each of these crops looked different from one another. For example, a corn and switch, a corn and sorghum, they're annual crops. So they're gonna be planted in really wide rows and they're, so you can easily walk through them, for example. But a lot of sunlight and radiation is much easier, can much more easily intercept and access the ground because of these rows that farmers are making. Uh, on the flip side, uh, sorghum, uh, Miss Kansas and switchgrass, these are perennials that are grown very, very densely. On the flip side, we also have early successional and uh, mixed prairie, which are polyculture crops. So these are multiple different species that are growing. And you can, and just from two years of data here, for example, you can see that the surface reflectivity or albedo during the growing season and winter are highly variable. So we can look at changes in a climate change from a seasonal perspective, a monthly perspective, even a daily perspective. So here's that picture of, you know, some somebody's kids <laughs> running through a corn, a corn um, plot in the middle of summer. But good luck trying to do that with a switchgrass plot or a sorghum plot as they're extremely dense and really, really tall. And showing how each of these crops are planted next to each other, you can see the vast differences visually. You can see agronomic practices, the, the planting in rows, the height of the plant, the, the density of the plants, the greenness, and all of these things affect surface reflectivity. How much radiation is going to be reflected back into the atmosphere versus warming the ground. So from, oops, oops. like over the course of a growing season from May to, to September, October. So in the growing, in the beginning of the growing season, you know, the landscape is really bare. You're gonna see a lot of red color, and that's really, really low albedo. So the land, the sunlight is just hitting the ground, being absorbed. As soon as you hit like May, uh, June, July, August, that's kind of like where the peak growing season for these crops occurring. So there's like homogeneous canopies. Everybody's all nice green and happy. So you see very similar green um, albedo, which is really high across the landscape. And then you come down to the end of the growing season, around September or so, and you see a different crops start to brown, different crops start to, 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 to persist in greenness based on their own phenology. We also looked at this in terms of changes in fertilization. We know that farmers like to get as much out of their crops as possible. So they're gonna go out there and they're gonna fertilize to get as much yield. And so we looked at the differences between if they had to fertilize versus not fertilizing and what would be the effects of surface reflectivity. And we saw that a lot of uh, the differences between non-fertilized crops and fertilized crops were not significant. And this is important because we know now that crops can grow well without the farmers having to supplement nitrogen, and that means they have to go out there with their, their crops, their planters with gas and nitrogen and all that sort of stuff to put it on the landscape. That can be removed from the equation. So there's multiple, so I'm sure it needs to show different uh, avenues as which surface reflectivity can affect the landscape. 
from the farmer perspective, from the landscape per perspective, from the urban perspective. So when we take our surface reflectivity, our albedo, and we convert it into uh, global warming potential values, uh, we can see here that there is um, a consensus of warming, of, sorry, of cooling on the landscape shown by the negative value. However, we can see that the changes in cooling effect are different between different types of landscapes. So, you know, corn is um, the lowest, but we have Miss Kansas and switchgrass, which are native grasses, performing really, really well at cooling the landscape. And these um, growing season values are very closely resembled to annual values. So if farmers are only interested in the growing season, great, they can see now from their growing season what's gonna happen for the rest of the year. And we don't have to base these observations just at a very, very small local scale. We can also show at a much larger scale. Take, for example, Southwest Michigan. Um, these observation-based measurements of albedo shown here can show that surface reflectivity is a very invaluable tool for calculating and improving climate models to understand how land use and land cover can affect climate warming and cooling. Here, we can see that uh, vegetation was shown to affect um, albedo by reducing the amount of so solar radiation that is being absorbed into the surface. So, take for example, we have you know Kalamazoo and Battle Creek over here, and from here we're seeing very high regions of, of carbon being emitted into the atmosphere. On the flip side, regions that have a lot of forest and grasslands. So in the north here and the far south here, they have very high carbon sequestration regions. And the albedo here is much higher. So a lot of the radiation is actually being reflected back into the atmosphere instead of cool, uh, warming the planet. So what can we do? So there's a lot of reasons that you know the, the climate is changing and humans are par primarily the cause of it. But because of our group, we can have the solution. You know, there are a lot of types of actions that we can do to reduce climate change. And this can take many different forms, such as conservation, um, emissions avoidance, change, sustainable changes in land use and land cover, um, and the sequestration of um, uh, greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide by reforestation, and long-term planning at different scales. This is not just a local thing or a regional thing. This can um, permeate through the entire planet. But you know that can be a little bit depressing when you see a lot of things that you know policies and um, climate and stakeholders might be doing, and it may be a little tough. And you're like, huh, I'm a high school student. What can I do? So what can we we do? So as you know, students here at you know the Battle Creek Math and Science Center, you guys are the future of our world. Great. So you guys are going to be the future climatologists, meteorologists, physical geographers, landscape ecologists who are going to be tackling these issues that affect us today and in the future as well. Um, so the ways that you can do that is by conserving energy in your everyday life. Uh, you know, you can track your own energy you say, and find ways to, to identify and reduce it. You can turn off your computer or uh, your cell phone instead of leaving TikTok and Facebook on for like 24 hours a day. You know, close your doors when you're heading out instead of leaving it open. Maybe ask your parents to not leave the car running for like 15 minutes when they're outside waiting to pick you up. You know, get your fellow students and teachers involved. There was a nine-year-old boy called Felix who was able to uh, muster his community to plant millions of trees in Germany in and around Europe. So you're not, you know, this is not something that you're like, well, this is so above me, I can't do anything. Even the smallest changes have a great impact. And one of the things I want to leave you with is find out your ecological footprint. Each and every one of us here has an ecological footprint, whether how small or how large it is. And we can make steps to reduce it and help uh, mitigate climate change as well. For example, I put in my information here and I saw that if everyone lived like me, we would need five Earths. <laughs> That's not great, especially when I drive you know, a much older vehicle and I drive 120 miles to get here and to get back, I'm using a lot of fossil fuels. At the same time, the ways that I can do to, the things that I can do to reduce the amount of Earths we will need to live on is um, I ride a motorcycle throughout the summer. So that is a lot more car uh, carbon efficient. 
um, and I live in a really small place, and it's, I'm working on insulating my attic and my basement, and that will help reduce the amount of um, gas that I will need to heat my and, and warm my house during the summer and the winter. And these are things that you can like think about. So I would you know, definitely encourage you all to check out the ecological footprint calculator and see how much you guys are contributing and what you can do to also reduce your footprints as well. Uh, that is pretty much it. Uh, I will take questions. Yes? So when you set up your stations, did you like, um, I assume you had to get like permission from like the farmers? To yes, the that has been very difficult. So for example, when I set up the, the station here at the Battle Creek Math and Science Center, I had to speak to the principal, I just spoke to Tim and to Scott, and every time I come to the Battle Creek Center, I just kind of be like, hi guys, I'm just going up to the roof. And, you know, you gotta set it up in time, you gotta you know, take steps to, to ensure your safety and the safety of the people who are around you. And it's the, basically the same thing with the farmers. Um, you know, we've been, we've been fortunate to have a lot of farmers who are very happy to, um, to have the data, to have the towers in their landscapes because it also benefits them. Yeah. But at the same time, we've also had issues of farmers not communicating when they're turning their pipes to precipitate or fertilize their crops and then $120,000 of sensors go kaput on the ground. Uh, so there is a, it is very difficult to you know, continue the, the communication with you know, private stakeholders, but um, you know, once we show that there is a benefit to this, you know, they're usually on board and be like, yes, let me have one of those, let me see when, is it, when it has it rained you know, and the amount of precipitation that has occurred for the last five years, because then I could try and start seeing patterns and yeah. start working towards when I should plant, when I should uh, fertilize when I should, you know, put water on the landscape. Yeah. And then how many do you have up currently? So we had 16. <laughs> um, but uh, because one of our projects were, was completed by the Department of Energy, we dismantled seven of them. So we still have about, about nine or so that are currently functioning in and around Michigan. And they, they range on multiple different types of landscapes. We have urban, suburban, like in Battle Creek, uh, agricultural lands, uh, wetlands, etc. Yes? What got you started in climate change research? So I always liked the environment from a young age. I wanted to be a volcanologist because I figured what the best way to die would be to you know, get pyroclastic <laughs> flow to death. But <laughs> I always thought volcanoes were cool and I grew up um, licking rocks um, for my undergraduate career. And I always just enjoyed uh, understanding and and being out in the environment and seeing the things that I was learning in the classroom actually uh, come out to play in, in my internships and um, my everyday life. So um, I kind of like continue to follow that, um, that aspect. Yes? Um, what kind of people do you work with? Like, do you have people that have to do the research and are they all experts in the field or different? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so for, for the most part, a lot of the people that I work with are, are experts in my field, kind of at the stage uh, that I'm at as a postdoctoral fellow right now. A lot of my research requires um, research. <laughs> so um, I'm working with people who are very, very knowledgeable. But at the same time, um, I have led an active like recruiting program for the last um, five or six years, six years, where um, I try to encourage, you know, um, students who are at the undergraduate level to come in for an internship and see what people like me are doing out in the field and in the in the office and in the, the labs and stuff and try to get them involved as well because it's one thing to you know take a class and be like oh we take precipitation with a precipitation gauge but have you ever actually seen one and a lot of and have you do you know how it works and how do you get your data from it and how do you quality control that data so we we do a lot of workshops both at the, the community level but also for internships for interested um, students who can come in and see how this works. And I've had a lot of my interns say, I wish we had learned this in class because you know it's one thing to have the, the material and to actually put it into practice as well. Yes? So when you were in college, what did you major in? Uh, in college, I majored in a geography and I focused a lot on uh, remote sensing and physical geography. Um, however, I ended up kind of like going all over the place in terms of geography for my uh, graduate programs. For my graduate programs, um, I kind of went where the money was. <laughs> so I did not want to pay for grad school. 
So one of my people that I had applied for said, we're, do, we're interested in doing um, bike sharing and changes in uh, bike sharing throughout the US. I said, great, if you'll pay me, I'll do it. Um, and then while I was doing that type of research, I also focused on hydrology of the Huron River in Ann Arbor. Um, for, my, for my doctoral program, I kind of uh, diverted a little bit more um, my, my advisor said, we have money for someone to focus on climate change and agricultural crops. I said, I have never dealt with agricultural crops before, but I'm always interested in learning, and this is climate change, this is, in, this is the environment, I'm still interested in this. So I made it into something that I was interested in, and I did that for my PhD. So I, have, I usually get a lot of uh, interns who say, you know, I, I have a degree in sustainability, I don't know if I could do like hard science. Like no, like you just need to believe that you can actually do it. Get uh, experience, talk to people, uh, make connections with people, and you could do that as well. Yes. Has any of like your research or things like that led to any kind of new policies or policy changes? And if not, do you hope that that's something that you can help in the future? That's a great question. Um, right now, I I would not say that my research yet has uh, enacted like some. Uh, mind-blowing, you know, uh, climato climatological, uh, environmental change. But at the the the, the smaller level, we, we interact with farmers who are interested in knowing how to keep their environments and their ecosystems and their crops as sustainable and as well like um, yielding as possible. And from there, you know, they get information on the changes in the, the environment, so the soil moisture, the nitrogen content, the precipitation. And from there, they're like, okay, I know that the growing season has kind of shifted a little bit an extra week, so I'll make plans to you know, go out and plant a little bit earlier, provided the weather you know, kind of works out. So it's not more of a, a huge statewide changes that's gonna you know, help everyone, but you know, these certain farmers are realizing, oh wow, you know, this information is actually useful for me to like, continue to do my livelihood. Any other questions? Yes, Jesse. I know um, global warming potential is calculated like strictly with albedo numbers, but um, is there another parameter that like considers whether something is a carbon sink? Like so, um, so you were half right. So albedo. So I focus solely on like incoming radiation and converting that into a global warming potential equivalent. Uh, however, you can also use the that same equation. Um, instead of taking the, the numerator, which was um, radiative force on top of the atmosphere, which includes surface reflectivity, you could do methane. Um, you could do nitrous oxide. Um, you could do um, uh, far, farmer input in, um, for what they're doing for their landscapes. And you could calculate the global warming impact based on those types of agents as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Southwest Michigan one, that was actually taken from remotely sensed data. So there are satellites out there that have taken you know, surface reflectivity and albedo measurements from the top of the atmosphere looking down. And it's great because you can you, you can see a much larger region um, very easily compared to, you know, you're sitting on the ground with a survey pole or you're on a tower which can sequence a region, but it's still relatively small. Um, so we have um, worked with uh, remotely sensed data of surface Activity, but we have noticed that with uh, remotely sensed data from satellites, you miss the temporal scale of your of your um, observations. So when we can have a tower on the ground that's taking measurements every five minutes forever, we can see what's happening at 10 a.m. and at 4 p.m. But a satellite usually only comes over every eight to 16 days, and you better hope there's no clouds that day or no precipitation or ice storms because you won't see anything, and then. It only comes over at one time, so usually in Michigan it's about 10:30. So whatever is happening at 10:30 on that day, that's the albedo that you're going to see. So if it was nice and sunny at 10:30 in the morning, and um, the satellite took the albedo, great. Then Michigan said, "Hold my beer," and it's cloudy and rainy for the rest of the day. And then, you know, so we don't see that temporal aspect of a surface reflectivity. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> this is a dumb question. But no, I'm no dumb question. Go for it. <laughs> I'm just curious. Why is the albedo for sand so low? Like, for sand? Yeah. I, 
it, I think it, it was like 0.2 or something. But like so the looks. albedo for sand um, can be, so the albedo for sand on like desert is usually around 0.4 because it's very highly reflective. However, uh, it can be as low as like 0 0.2, 0 0.1, even less than that when there are other properties in play, such as the nutrients in the soil, whether the soil is really dry, whether it's really wet after a precipitation event. So it can vary. Thank you very much, guys. 